People, my people, welcome to the, in, in, the <clears throat> sorry, interview with Imbu Distillery. Mick and Mel sat down with me in their distillery and we chatted and chatted and chatted. Um, and if you want to play an interesting game, what you do is you drop a GNT every time one of us swears. And if you're awake at the end of the interview, then you've done really well. Um, because basically, between friends, I had do admit I had been at the distillery for a little bit before. <clears throat> Mick has a absolutely huge collection of gins and we had been encouraged to not only try his gin collection that he personally has but also to sample a lot of the product at the distillery. And so what could possibly go wrong? Um, nothing. As far as I'm concerned this was the most fun uh, interview I've done to date and easily the best. So enjoy the interview with Mick and Mel from Imbue Distillery in the northern Mel northeastern Melbourne suburb of Research. Okay, um, welcome to yet another uh, edition of From the Still, and I must admit that I have imbibed this morning. Um, I'm with Mick and Emma from Imbue Distillery, and I'm... Best bluefar, my name's Mel. Mel, yeah, okay. That was deliberate, actually. Was yes. <laughs> it sounds like you're a spiritualist. Yeah, I am indeed a spiritualist. Yeah. Yes, I get into the spirits. It's, um, it's invoke the Holy Ghost of ethyl alcohol, which um, my darling wife, who's a science teacher, will tell you is indeed a solution. So if anyone tells you alcohol is not a solution, you go, no, no, you're wrong. From a chemistry point of view, it is the solution. Uh, I like that. Well, wasn't it Newton that was M equals GNT? I I'm did. not sure. I could, could have got that wrong. But. <laughs> Selena? <laughs> Selena? Yeah, she's busy. She's we'll gone. move on without her. Yeah, she's more likely out there drinking. Um, so the other question that I thought was particularly challenging that I know you spent oh, nanoseconds you could be considering before you answered it is um, <laughs> your website says you do a lot of wild forage botanicals. Is that because they're cheap? Um, because the wild varieties happen to be particularly robust in their flavours? Or we're up in Nillenburg and I think your local members, state members actually are green, isn't she? Or something? It's, no, it's, it's very green up here. There's definitely around here, yeah. yeah it's, uh, it's not really about the price, though. It's no. probably by the time probably we... probably costs us more to do forage than it would to actually purchase it from a supplier. It's, but you don't get the same flavour. So, and we're all about flavour. And for us, because we're food background, so Mel's a very accomplished chef, Nikki's a very accomplished chef, uh, Luke and I have been bakers for, I was 24 years, and Luke was about 15 years. So for us, it's about more about the flavours than whether or not we can buy it in a bag. And being able to go out and collect it and forage it gives you that tactility and knowing that, okay, just like a piece of steak, just like salad, just it's all seasonal. You pick it at the wrong time it's going to taste completely different and we find that with our products it's about what you can instill in the product and oh, distill or distill <laughs> <laughs> in... uh, yeah because it's like the main thing that we forage is the wild fennel and that it would be way easier if we just used it. farmed fennel because or seeds or... because the flavor changes so much seasonally that every run of gin we have to adjust to compensate for the flavor if it's young and it's fresh you need less if it's been oh am i going out the wrong way around it's fine whatever it, it, yeah, yeah. we have it's to okay. adjust the batch for the we, flavor of yeah. the fennel we get life bass backwards in my house on a regular basis <laughs> right, yeah, um, and it should be noted for those of you who do not live in melbourne that an awful lot of wild fennel grows alongside railway lines yeah it does Rail, railway lines and creeks mostly as, yeah. as does uh, prickly pears. pears, dandelions, and blackberries, which are four of our key botanicals that we use in and everything else. Makes I can't gin, reach it. That's okay. Uh, in our suburban, in suburban, suburban gin. barrel aged gin. Yeah, that's the one I couldn't touch. I had to give to my special yes. guest reviewer, Blake, who, um, when I said to him, oh, Do you want free booze? And went, Okay, you're allowed one stupid question for the day. Um, what's your other one? <laughs> Yeah, so it, it, it's one of those things that when, when we're foraging the botanicals, it can take us a very, very long time. Like we're coming into about three or four weeks away from starting to pick blackberries and we have to be really careful with where we get the blackberries from. We've got to make sure my mum's got a massive property. 
and we do forage some of hers and we forage some we've grown but we have to make sure they're not being sprayed they're not sprayed Mm. so when when we can't get them we actually have no option or when we're not sure about the quality or whether or not they've been sprayed or we can't get in contact with the farmers or whoever owns the property we do have to buy we buy Yarra Valley sometimes and their berries out there are absolutely beautiful so we do support when we can't forage it we do use other people to help us get get some of those botanicals like prickly pears are an absolute they're, they're an art they're assholes yes yeah. they're really friggin' prickly and they're yeah, very tasty um... they make a beautiful cordial actually the story behind why we put them in was kind of yeah funny. so we first started using the prickly pear in the gin and then we've made the bittersweet aperitivo because there's so much flesh still on the skin um and we weren't using the skin so we didn't want to waste that so that became a cordial but prickly pears ferment very quickly, so very, quickly. very soon went from a cordial to a, a liqueur because the alcohol obviously stabilizes it. But the first time we picked them, we were just I've like, never had them before, and you're like, oh no, these oh prickly pears God. are amazing. We needed you need to try them. Yeah. But we didn't. We just pulled over. I don't know where we were. On uh, the well, side we were of the getting road. road fruit, so we drive uh, in the country before we had Eddie. We used to drive in the country and just randomly pick fruit from the sides of the roads. We nicknamed it road fruit. Anything that we could forage, we'd try, we'd make things out of, we'd make jams, we'd make preserves, quinces, whatever. Fennel, whatever. It didn't matter what it was. And one day we we went to, we were going somewhere. I think we were going to, a, it was it a quince tree or a fig yeah, tree? A quince tree quinces. and the quinces had all been taken. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that's okay, we'll get some of these. But we, we had no yeah. tongs or gloves or anything. And so we picked them and then we didn't even have a bag in the car somehow. Threw and them they on, threw them on the front seat of the they car. They rolled all over the car and there were pickles everywhere. everywhere. I um I actually made that mistake. There's a um, prickly pear around the corner from where we live, so and the parents are getting into it. Kids, oh, the parents are eating it. It's got to be good. Absolutely. Grab one slice, one open. Got a face full of prickles. Yeah. And and then got called a um idiot repeatedly by the woman behind the camera. <laughs> you idiot. See, in that exact tone, it's when I know that I've been a um a husband because it's that that tone. You idiot. And okay, oh okay. Um. I just but normally the... use the excuse when I do something stupid. Look, what I'm doing is showing our daughter it's okay to make mistakes. <laughs> I think it works, but it's not true completely. <laughs> anyway.